Hi everyone, I'm here with Matt Davis, or Matthew Davis. Um, Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Vincent. I'm happy to be here. Yes, well, I'm happy to have you here. It's your, your first time on the podcast and we are uh, launching the English language segment of this new, um, I mean, this new format on, on our podcast, which is uh, a bibliography format or a book club book club format, whatever you want to call it, uh, we will have, I mean, we will be the two of us every time talking about a, a book that I, either one of us will have chosen. And uh, this time, since you are the guest, of course, you are the first one to choose and you um, proposed, you offered that you that we speak about uh, Terror and Liberalism by Paul Berman. So it's a book that was published in 2003 by W.W. Uh, w. Norton. At least that's the edition that I own. Uh, maybe there are other editions, but it doesn't matter. So Terror and Liberalism is the, is the title. Paul Berman is the writer. There is no subtitle. And maybe you can open by giving us so I should I should uh, clarify that we have both read this book, so we we will uh, both be able I hope to uh, say interesting things about it. But uh, yeah, maybe you can open by giving a general presentation of uh, of the book. I mean, just whatever you want to say that is pretty broad about about this book. Sure. Um, this to me was Berman's response to the 9-11 attacks um, and the war on terror in general. Um, is basically his theory of what the war on terror actually should be. And uh, to him, it uh, was more about uh, the ideas um, of the Islamists than, you know, a, mi a military uh, campaign. Uh, he saw it as a war of ideas versus a a, a carnal war, and um, his his theory basically was that um, Islamism, um, the um, animating uh, ideology of the 9/11 hijackers, um, is basically a variant of 20th century totalitarianism. Um, and the differences are very small between it and, and all the classical uh, pathological mass movements in Europe in the 20th century, early 20th century. And he, to him, um, fighting Islamism would be akin to, to fighting Nazism, whereas it had you have to it has to be shameful to be a Nazi. It would need to be shameful to be a Islamist, um, you're not going to, you know, bomb, bomb it out of them, so to speak. So he basically laid out the uh, intellectual uh, bedrock of the movement um, in, in this book and uh, talks about uh, people who seem to uh, chronically fail to understand uh, what these people want or what they're doing. And uh, drew some uh, pretty pretty um, interesting examples of uh, similar failures in the past with uh, Nazism and uh, people witnessing Nazism in its early stages, um, how utterly they failed to see that um, the Third Reich uh, was doing what it said it was doing, and it wasn't code for um, some petty grievance uh, or some hardship that they were going through. They weren't deranged by the Treaty of Versailles, uh, you know, punitive measures put on them. It wasn't, uh, they weren't uh, so poor that they were uh, gassing people and expanding the Third Reich. Uh, they actually believed what they said they believed. And the same goes for the uh, Islamist movement uh, as far as Berman can, can see it. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's basically it. I mean, it's a it's a it's a comparison of uh, 20th century totalitarian movements and modern day Islamism. 
uh, and I think at the time, 2003, um, that was fairly uh, um, groundbreaking for uh, at least our uh, intelligence here, our intelligence agencies. Um, Islamic extremism was still pretty fresh in 2003. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it was there was zero knowledge um, be- before 9/11, and this is pretty heavy material uh, all in one book for uh, 2003. And when you I don't know if you've heard him speak uh, in interviews, but he is really into it. I mean, he's an, he's an intense guy. I've um, I've listened to the interview. I think it was with Charlie Rose, right on whichever uh, network that was. I think it's the only one that I've that I've heard from him. Yeah, yeah, book TV. I think. Yeah, book could TV. be that. Could be that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it might be the only one on YouTube. Actually, he doesn't have a lot of videos. No, that's uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. I would. He's I would a, guess he's so. a fan. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you've um, nicely introduced what I would regard as maybe the main two ideas of of the book, which is one, I mean, which are one, the um, uh, numerous and deep similarities between 20th century European totalitarian ideologies, especially national socialism and fascism, but also to a lesser extent, I would, I would guess, uh, communism. So on, on the one hand, I mean, the similarity between, on the one hand, these ideologies and these practices, and on the other, uh, Islamism. So that would be main idea number one. And the main idea number two is the, uh, I mean, it's very much connected to, to the first one, but it's, it's really the idea that... Um, at least a fair portion of people who are in Islamist uh, movements and who say they believe in the do- in the doctrine of the version of of Islam to which they adhere, well, you can take their word for it. They do uh, believe it, and these are two already very uh, fast subjects of discussion, and we we can um, deepen them. In, in a little while, but first I thought um, I would like to just clarify one of the terms in the title of the book, uh, because terror, of course, we understand what it is based on what you explained. It's, uh, in this case, Islamic terrorism. Um, and so the title is Terror and Liberalism. And I think it's it might be easy to misunderstand that, and maybe I misunderstood it myself. But you can tell me what you, what your thoughts were, because you know, <clears throat> I think many people have made the argument that uh, people usually on the political left have failed, um, whether it's on purpose or not, failed to understand the motivations of Islamic terrorists. And uh, in contemporary English-speaking language, um, it's been it's become common to use left of center and liberal as synonyms, but it, it's not the way Berman uh, uses it. He uses it in you know the more classical sense, if you will, as people have now become accustomed to call it, um, meaning really the sort of more original idea of uh, liberalism as a political theory of society where the um, state guarantees individual rights and you have all the basic freedoms that are uh, enshrined in the law. Hmm? Separation of church and state. Yes. Free trip. Exactly. Uh, all, all the things that makes life happy and worth living for everyone, including <laughs> right-wingers and left-wingers in America. We all enjoy liberal uh, principles uh, in our society. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a real disaster that that word is synonymous with the left. It really makes no sense at all. Well, yeah, that, that's um, yeah, that, that's uh, a question we could explore, but I, we, we can just be, I think, happy with the clarification so far that yeah, you know, yeah, he, sure. he meant it. He meant it in this way, meaning really, uh, the uh, Islamic terrorists were or are still to this day, of course, 
Uh, I mean, adherence to an ideology that really opposes the um, ideology of political liberalism understood in, in the proper sense. He didn't mean, as one could think or could guess, uh, that uh, so-called liberals, meaning people on the left, might have misunderstood terror, Islamic terror. Although yeah, a, that's part he, of his argument. But, there's a dual meaning there. He's like okay. he's flipping between the, the two, I ah, think. Okay, so then... Sorry, that's, sorry to interrupt you. It's fine, it's fine. It's good to clarify this because... Yeah. It's confusing, though, because it, he does talk about the left in the way that we're saying the left. Yes. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Also, but I think you're right. I think the title of the book is the liberalism in the classical sense. Yes, although he does, of course, as you as you say, and as we will uh, explore further in, in the following minutes, he does certainly uh, talk about people who have come to be known as liberals these days and uh, who have difficulties sometimes in uh, understanding or accepting some of the stated motives of the Islamic terrorists. Um, yes. So I guess we could we could actually start with that um, because he devotes quite a bit of uh, space to that discussion of the motives of, I mean, of, of how the of how the motives of the terrorists have been um, misunderstood, and uh, of course we can connect that to. Books such as uh, yeah, Sam Harris's *The End of Faith*, for instance, which also had a lengthy argument on a very similar question, and um, also the book by Hitchens, *God Is Not Great*, and there have been other oh, books. More recently, Graham Garrard has written on the topic. Um, you know, the um, *The Way of the Strangers*, I think, is, is is the title of his book. I actually have it behind me, but I haven't read it so far. Yeah, I've downloaded it. I have it on Audible. I yeah. haven't listened to it. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, he uh, he discusses this at length. And, um, well, I mean, it's been a staple of sort of intellectual debates since uh, 9-11. It has come back and forth to the, to the forefront. 9-11 uh, was the main, I mean, you know, main factor of why this debate became so important, I guess, among other things, then <clears throat> the London attacks, the Paris attacks, and so on and so forth. Every time, you know, every time there is a major terror attack, at least in the West, because we tend to be blind to what is uh, happening in the East, so to say, because there is pretty much daily terror. It's hard to, there. Hard to keep up with. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much impossible. Every... But yeah, every time there is... Um, a new attack, uh, at least a major one in the West. Uh, pretty much the same people come to, um, I mean, come to come on the media, and they have the same arguments and uh, the same disagreements. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I've already had an interview on, on this topic on the podcast with um, a researcher from the London School of Econom Economics. His name is Stefan Hertog, and he. He um, examined the uh, sort of uh, sociology of the um, adherence to Islamist movements in Northern Africa. But uh, we, yeah, this is, uh, well, it's, it's very relevant, but I should, I should let you speak a little bit and maybe um, you could discuss some of Berman's points concerning uh, the relationship between the stated ideology of Islamism and the, um, well, the terrorist groups? Well, you know, I, I, he, he gave a lot of examples of uh, French anti-war socialists um, during the rise of the Third Reich. And I don't know that uh, I can recall exactly what his diagnosis was for what causes them to behave that way. It, I took it more as just like an anthology of them behaving that way mm -hmm. uh, versus saying why. Uh, so there's no like psychological uh, 
prescript uh, diagnosis except for when he gets into Noam Chomsky. I thought um, that was a kind of a connection uh, because Noam Chomsky is actually actively offering uh, a, uh, a, a, another narrative. So it's one thing to hear what uh, Islamists say and it just be so alien to you that um, you try to make sense of it and you end up sounding foolish. And it's another thing to be saying uh, actively offering a different narrative in the face of the person who's doing the, uh, you know, committing an atrocity, telling you what their motivating principles are to insist that something else is going on. Uh, um, so like thoroughly the way Chomsky does. And uh, so matter of fact, I, th I think he uh, Berman gave him as an example as someone who's kind of pumping out a. Uh, um, um, another narrative, and it's it's almost um, cynical in a way. Um, it always seems to be a grievance the anti-war movement of the period already had anyway with the with the government. So that so violence comes along or or horror comes along, and they they say, "See, I told you so." You know that uh, if you if we we you know if we wouldn't have done this thing I didn't want you to do in the first place this wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. and it just never matches up to what the perpetrator is saying about their own mind and um, it's really kind of shameful but yeah I remember there was a there was a line in the book where he said uh, something about the anti-war socialists staring across the Rhine uh, and refusing to accept uh, the the um, Hitler's Hitler and uh, millions of upstanding Germans were being animated by the lure of murder and blood curdling hatred and ancient myths. Um, I, I mean, it is shocking to hear about it. I mean, I, I, it was before I was alive and to hear about it in history books is shocking, but I can't imagine not, you know, not taking someone at their word, but these are smart people that were making this error. So. Yeah. But today, I mean, it, it still goes on and I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Today, it seems to be more of a uh, motivated by not wanting to ostracize groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's that sort of pressure, though, um, for the other t totalitarian movements. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? The sort of... Um, on being uncouth or, you know, speaking too broadly about a group of people. Um, but in Europe, it seems hard to miss. I mean, Germany and France, it's you're too close together to not, you know, not know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, one thing I've noticed actually is that, um, well, it, it's a debate that has taken... The, I mean, it has gone to the background a little bit lately, in, in, in the very, in the very last years, I would say. There was, of course, a big wave of attacks in in Western Europe in uh, 2015, 2016. But since, you know, a lot has happened. Has happened, and I, I don't think the media cares about it that much. Um, I mean, other things have taken the <laughs> really, really the lead in in the media's attention. Uh, the election of Trump, Brexit, Gosh. <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, which I mean, you know, can be can be understood to some extent because there haven't been. I mean, the the intensity of the terror. Uh, has gone down in since maybe late, late 2016. So these these debates have receded a little bit, um, but I mean they are still there in the background, of course. And it's it's still you you it's still obviously a point of contention between between people. That's for sure. Um, yeah. So. I mean, what can I, what, what else can I say? I, I don't know. I mean, um, well, um, Chomsky was saying that, you know, he, he was, uh, over Berman was 
suggesting that Chomsky oversimplifies. He thinks mm -hmm. Chomsky thinks that the world is that all uh, of our affairs with other people, all of our conflicts, all of our interactions are governed by uh, a want for fr uh, for freedom or for power. You know, like a too simple, uh, a very too, uh, very simple explanation for everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think he's the the, the uh, originator of this idea that people who are a part of a irrational pathological mass movement. Are, must be responding to something uh, terrestrial or mm -hmm. uh, reasonable, yeah, um, yeah. but he, he certainly uh, canonized it. He was he, he 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 put his name his his reputation in linguistics and his uh, esteem uh, on sort of a wonky uh, idea or, mm -hmm. or an incomplete idea, yeah. misguided. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I forgot to. Um to comment further on, on the points you've made in, in your previous intervention, which is, I think you're very right that maybe about, well, oh, it's been almost 20 years now since 9-11, say, just to round it, round it up to make it easy, about 20 years ago, for sure, the, um, the main point of contention was about the... Um, the role of Western and, in particular, American foreign policy in these um, in these events and these attacks. Uh, whereas I think this is the what, what you what you said earlier. Um, more recently, it, it's it's been a little bit more about local matters in um, Western societies. For one thing. I mean, many of the terrorists may in the in the mid uh, teens, I guess the name of the decade would be the current decade. In the mid in the mid twenty tens, they were born and raised in France and Belgium, in the uh, UK, for instance. So then the the conversation often focused on well, more local grievances that were attributed actually to to the terror cells in, in Western Europe, whether, I mean, whether they were attributed rightly or wrongly is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question we, we can discuss, but uh, certainly, you know, the, the idea that uh, people who, I mean, people with Muslim background or even really not even just the background but say people with them of the muslim faith who live in western europe are you know in a state of siege pretty much in in western europe this idea is recurrent um there is this idea that they are well very much unfairly focused upon by the media, by a certain sector of the political class, just by a certain sector of the the population, <clears throat> and um, it, to the extreme. This, I mean, sometimes, I mean, often actually, this, this idea has been taken to the extreme of. Which which consists in stating that um, Muslims in contemporary Europe would be the equivalent of the Jews in 1930s Europe. This has been stated on a regular basis by by some, and um, that's appalling. Yeah, it's it, I mean it's plainly false. It seems to me, but um, this is essentially one of the main the main talking points that has been has been uttered and um the i mean the, the the causal link that is proposed is that you know if you are maybe from a disadvantaged uh, family you grew up in a ghetto you have little money little prospects 
some part of the sort of majority population is um, prejudiced against you. Uh, your religion is, quote, m unfairly mocked and maligned in the media, including in caricatures and stuff. Then these are some factors. Inclu also, I mean, there's still talk of like French intervention in Syria, for instance, or British intervention. The these would be the factors that are claimed to be front and center. I mean, my best guess, and I think it would be a decently educated guess, is that these factors are relevant, but to make them exclusively relevant and front and center really seems to me to miss the point. It's also just, um, <clears throat> it's just wrong. Uh, it's incorrect. It's, it, and you can discover it being incorrect very quickly. I mean, the, the, most of the people who have, who have been either uh, coordinators or active participants in all of the high profile terrorist attacks in Western Europe and America in the past uh, 15 years or so mm. uh, have been almost without exception, um, highly educated, uh, affluent com compared and that, that including compared with their Muslim, uh, your fellow uh, Western European or American Muslim contemporary. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 they stand out, and even compared to them uh, in terms of uh, education, uh, and you know the wealth of their families, and it's it's almost the rule is that 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 they're usually wealthy and well educated, and them being from the ghetto and downtrodden mm -hmm. would be an exception. Um, that is true. I think it changed a little bit in the in the mid twenty twenty tens, though. I um, I think the sure, like, uh, the profile yeah. the changed Charlie a little Hebner bit. Guy. For instance, uh, yes, they're kind of the dregs of society. But yeah, um, but it, it is true that many of them have been uh, very educated. I mean, one can only think of the nine eleven hijackers uh, right. to, to make that point, and um, I think it's been the case in in many other. Uh, many other instances, and okay, changing the changing the location a little bit of the of focus. Uh, this uh, this researcher whom I was mentioning before, he really saw that um, among people who take part in Islamist movements, whether they be violent or non-violent, people with engineering degrees in particular are very much. Mm -hmm overrepresented and i think uh, yeah. if memory serves me right to a lesser extent there are people with a medical degree and maybe also law but i might make the this last part up as i'm not sure but well, for well, sure that, yeah that's, that's bin laden and uh, zawahiri uh engineering and medical yeah uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Have, they're like the uh, figureheads of that yeah, yeah. And, and uh um atta the the, the mm -hmm. uh he was an engineering guy. Yeah. I think he was. Uh, he lived in Germany, right? He, he lived in Germany. in Germany. He lived in Germany. Yes, yes. Some, I think, lived in the U.S. Yeah, that is true. But I think this is a little bit less true if you go to the um, people who were born and raised in in Western Europe. Even if you compare them to the rest of the Muslim population, it's not so much the case anymore. At least in the in the more recent waves of terror. So, I mean, I think the um, the other factors which I've mentioned certainly should not be discounted, but oh, no, no. to make them the sole explanation is uh, a grave error. And this was clarified of all people by uh, ISIS themselves, you remember, in this um, yes. memorable issue that of their big. magazine that big uh, yeah they had the amazing this, clear writing <laughs> yes it was very well clear. written yeah very well written very well uh edited very well i mean the the, the visuals in the magazine I were i should have printed that out <laughs> that's amazing the visuals in the magazine were really something that is um yeah uh, of a very high level um 
yeah, I mean, they, I mean, it was clarified in this um, very forceful text. I think it was published in the summer of 2015 or was it 2016? I can't remember. 15 sounds about right. Maybe, okay. yeah, I, I don't know either. It could be 16. Either one of these, of these two years. And uh, yeah, it was clarified with, um, I mean, extreme um, unmistakability, I would say, that yeah, uh, the main factors in the, uh, well, ISIS-driven, if you will, campaigns of terror again, against Western countries were, were really... Uh, theological grievances. Yeah. And this was very much in line with the uh, Bin Laden. Um, I mean, w with what he was saying back in the days of uh, when he was the, the leader of, of these movements. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Th this uh, Berman also discusses, right? Yeah, yeah. He, the, he was... Uh... Uh, bin Laden was the he kind of cracked open the uh, cal the idea of the caliphate uh, you know uh, fantasizing about uh, restoring the lost Ottoman Empire um, that's that may not sound theological and may, that's it's it, but with this religion in particular it's it's tough to separate um, because it is it is a, a theological goal to have a uh, political end um, with with this faith in particular. And I'm mm -hmm. sure, you know, with at one point with Christianity, with Christendom and stuff like that, it was similar. But um, what sounds terrestrial and political uh, is interchangeable with theological with this particular religion. So with Sunni Islam in particular. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I can see where some confusion could come in, but yeah, Bin Laden was, uh, uh, he also, um, kind of made it okay, uh, to, um, attack Westerners, uh, uh, randomly. He was kind of like the front, one of the front runners on that. Um, I don't know if you heard about that famous, uh, fatwa he sent to the, uh, London newspaper. He faxed it over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, um, so, yeah, that, I mean, I, I think uh, it's interesting to, to, to discover stuff like for me. I mean, I've, I've, I was brought up in a, a religious family, so I, I've never had any trouble um, understanding that people can have uh, strange beliefs and mm. uh, really 100 percent believe in it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it can get you to do nearly anything, really. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but I didn't know the specifics. Like, I didn't know this guy, Syed Qutub, mm -hmm. uh, uh, until really until I got uh, this book. And I didn't I didn't read this book until 2014 or so um, when ISIS was kind of uh, coming together. Yeah, yeah. Because they were sort of, well, this subject for me was sort of off my radar. And I know that sounds <laughs> very selfish and because it's, it's been ongoing for a long time and for a lot of people. But um, there, you know, like you said, it was 9-11 and then there was um, uh, London, mm -hmm. uh, Madrid. Yeah. So obviously, those are big deals. And sure. I'm, not, I'm not saying off my radar in that way, but. You know what I mean? Um, there wasn't a group with a name going, uh, uh, you know, that we were, there was a war in Iraq that was kind of taking everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. You know, IEDs exploding every single day on the news uh, yeah, yeah. for a long time. Um, but uh, ISIS really, uh, was particularly nasty. And um, so I saw an article, there was a guy named, uh, the writer, journalist named James Bloodworth wrote an article called uh, Why Does ISIS Hate Us So Much or something like that. Um, and this was in 2014 before I, Graham Wood, uh, before yeah. I heard of Graham Wood or anyone like that. Um, and he was quoting Berman a lot. It was basically just a paraphrasing of Berman, the whole article. Okay. But it, it was really fascinating. 
and that's why I got the, this this book in the first place. But mm-hmm. so yeah, from through him, I heard about Syed Kutub, and about and it, it turns out you know like all the big books on this subject from the same time period, like uh, the Looming Tower and. Um, uh, George Packer wrote a book about the war in Iraq, but all the side could was being talked about by a lot of people after the nine 11 attacks. And, but I don't think anyone has, has, uh, laid his ideas out. Um, um, or actually Berman gets into who influenced Kutub, mm-hmm. um, some like, uh, uh, romantic poets like, uh, yeah. uh um, uh, Victor Hugo, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, to be honest, some of the it got, the book does get a little deep, like uh, with mm-hmm. the Albert Camus stuff. Uh, I, I won't pretend to fully understand the connection between um, his idea of, of, of rebellion, and I, I know he, he describes it as like a uh, where you get from uh, uh, wanting to be free and be a rebel, uh, and, and that somehow mutates into uh, suicide as like an ultimate form of rebellion um, because you're, you're, di- you know, you're dictating the circumstances of your own death. You know, it's up to you. You're in charge. Mm-hmm. But the crossover uh, in Camus mind and, and I guess Berman buys into Camus idea uh, from, you know, from the, where, where you're starting off with a, a, the, or the instinct to rebel and that, uh, and, you know, to make your own life for yourself, and, and, but how that gets to, uh, um, you know, rejecting mo- moral norms as a form of rebellion, um, uh, gratuitous violence for its own sake. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, um, that's is like the ultimate rebellious behavior, just th- re- like uh, rejecting liberal civilization. Uh, um, as rebellion, that's sort of um, what he thought uh, the totalitarian movements were doing, mm-hmm. and what a bin Ladenist uh, is doing. I think he, I, I think he got actually, I, it's, I think he got a little bit too caught up in ma- drawing a direct comparison because I, I, I don't know if that. I mean, it's 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 an, it's lovely to think about, but I, I I I do think it's more theological than Berman lets on, but. He seemed a little shy, even in his interview. He seemed shy about putting that on them, uh, about emphasis, focusing too much on the theological stuff. I, I'd, lo- I'd love to hear what he, if he read that Dabiq article and what he thought of it. Mm. I mean, it, it vindicates him just uh, to a large degree. I mean, when because he was basically saying his argument was they mean what they say. Yeah, yeah. And that part is held up for sure. Yeah. But it's not a perfect, it doesn't map perfectly onto the... Uh, the totalitarian movements, I don't think, but close enough for sure. Maybe it maps better to what Sam Harris wrote, the, the that big article. I mean, when I remember when reading it, this uh, this article by ISIS, thinking to myself, has you know, I mean, this type of sort of social commentary, geopolitics that mixes up with sociology, theology, it's, it's very hard to make correct statements. Um, and mm-hmm. I remember thinking to myself, has has anyone been vindicated so much as Sam Harris? <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, as he was vindicated by, by this article in this, in this domain of difficult questions, I, I really was... I felt, gr- I felt happy for him. Well, Honestly. yeah. It, it's, it must be exhausting to be the only uh, Western uh, guy from California uh, <laughs> saying this stuff about a religion like Islam. Yeah. It's very awkward, you know. Yeah, awkward is the word, but he he hasn't he hasn't relented. But he too, I think, has I think left that a little bit behind him. Now he's not so keen to discuss these things. I think he's devoted so much time and energy and. Also, some other stuff has become, I suppose, more pressing in general public debates. But um, yeah, I mean, once you once if you're recording yourself speak and you and you've said everything that there could be to say about something, because the the religion isn't changing, uh, <laughs> that's not going to get updated. So um, he doesn't need to update his arguments. 
but um, I, I'm always suspicious of people who are who who like uh, this is like their hobby horse, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Like uh, th- there are certain people I'm suspicious about um, who who you know are are like Sam Harris moved on because he said all he needs to say, and mm-hmm. that's, I think that's the way it should be. Mm. And I don't know. It has calmed down a little bit too. I think he would probably have a some a word or two to say if something of uh, large magnitude happened. But the past couple of times he has, he said, "There's not much new I have to say here." So yeah. yeah, yeah. But I wonder. Um, I, I, um, you said you've read Berman's other book, right? Yeah, the one of the book is called um, "The Flight of the Intellectuals." Does it touch any of this stuff? Yeah, very much so. It's um, it's almost a follow up, I would I would say, uh, on uh, on terror and liberalism. This book, um, the flight of the intellectuals. So, <clears throat> I went into it thinking it would discuss, um, well, it it would it would deepen the discussion of, um. You know, left of center, left of center intellectuals' unwillingness, or sort of, I don't know what the word is, but say failure at least to to grapple with some of the main motives of Islamic terror, which uh, of course is the motivation for this book, and uh, it it discusses that. But I realized that it was largely. Uh, devoted to discussing the uh, legacy and reception of two very different um, public intellectuals who came from a Muslim background and who really became famous, say, around the same time, maybe at the turn of the of the millennium. And those would be uh, Tariq Ramadan and Ayan Hirsi Ali. Oh. And uh, so he compares the way they have been received in the media and in intellectual circles in Western countries. And uh, so I should, I should explain briefly who these two people are. So Ramadan, he is a supposedly a scholar of Islam. At least, I mean, I think that's... <laughs> he, has, he has some I'm claim. To, Ramadan. He has you some know, claim to that, I suppose. Yeah. That's, Terror, he gets a mention in terror and liberalism yeah, yeah. early on. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and Berman really gentle with him. I mean, I, sorry, I don't want to de- derail you, but it, it's I, it, you're being very nice to Ramadan, as far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm only starting, but uh, it's not going to get. I mean, it's it's going to get meaner. So <laughs> great. Uh, I don't think Berman is is nice to him in in the follow up book at all. Um, in in the flight of the intellectuals, I think he is um, actually very um, very critical of him, although quite rightly. But he does point the fact that he, I mean, Ramadan has been received mostly as this apparent, uh, sort of ostensibly moderate or somewhat moderate figure uh, in in the media. Um, maybe even more so in the English-speaking media than in the French-speaking one, because he's mostly a French-speaking uh, intellectual. He's Swiss, isn't he? He is Swiss of nationality, yes. But I know he he he, uh, he's, he lives in France, right? Or went or well, or no, no. There? Well, no. I think I'm not even sure. He was in jail for a few months on oh, char- wow. on charges of rape. Jesus. Um. But I'm not sure was he was he freed or not. In any case, I don't think he's been tried for it. So there's some follow up for that. Um, there will be there will be more. But in any case, he got a chair to teach at whichever very prestigious British university it was. It was either Cambridge or Oxford. Uh, so he was really lionized by uh, academia in this case. Uh, uh-huh. Giving giving him a chair or something, some professorship. I I don't remember the exact title, but something very prestigious at an extremely prestigious in- institution. But Berman, you know, re- sort of warns his reader that uh, if you look at uh, Ramadan's the, uh, work throughout his life, essentially, 
his main uh, thrust is to defend and uphold the legacy of his grandfather, of course, who is Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this we can talk a little bit more in what follows. I mean, I think this opens up essentially the the discussion on the uh, the links between Islamism and totalitarianism, because here the connection is quite direct. But yes, Ramadan, he has, you know, spent a lot of time and energy in, in the influence uh, defending the works and the words of his grandfather, who was the original um, Muslim brother and quite clearly uh, friendly to European fascism, German national yeah. socialism. Um, so, and in spite of this, or, well, notwithstanding this, through, I would, I would, I would guess, carefully um, sort of cultivated ignorance on the part of the media, he has been taken more or less seriously by, well, those who Berman calls the intellectuals. And on the other hand, he contrasts that with the reception of the work of Ayan Hirsi Ali, who was, um, you know, someone who escaped arranged marriage, who found asylum in the Netherlands, then she left Islam, she uh, entered politics. And uh, she was, of course, very critical of her former faith, but uh, she was not really... Um, beloved by by the media, at least for a while she was, but at some point I think they they started getting a bit tired. I think um, I mean I, I think it's an e it's a safe guess to to venture that they 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 got tired of her incessant critic of her former faith. Um, yeah, I, I, that's uh, that case is of uh, Ion Hersiali is baffling to me. <laughs> uh, it's it's crazy. You have uh, you know a a woman of color, if you will, <laughs> uh, who who was a, a, when I say oppressed, I'm gen I mean the you know the real definition of the word oppressed mm -hmm. and rode on trains by herself, hopped, hopped trains yeah. to get to Europe from Somalia. And she became a member of Dutch parliament and speaks multiple languages and is a confident, uh, intelligent, beautiful woman. And she is criticizing an extreme religion that does this not just to her, but to millions of other girls and women. And she is the target of scrutiny of the progressive left. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so backwards and wrong and upside down. It's hard to understand. Yeah. All the doors were closed to her after some point. I mean, all the doors of I mean, people who claim to be against oppression of women and um, against conservative and reactionary religion. But their doors swiftly were were closed on her and uh so she had to i mean to accept the help and the uh, the interest of um other sorts of people whose company she was um well scolded for navigating for accepting you know the fact that she yeah, came to work at was it the american enterprise institute or something like that or? That's, that's right that's right they're yeah. they're not they're not info wars. <laughs> they're, they're just a they're just a conservative, slot, you know, right of center. Uh, mm. They're a they're a serious organization, you know. Yeah. They're a, they're adults. They're they're still li liberal in the classical sense. Mm. They're not maniacs. Uh, they're just conservative on certain issues. Uh, and yeah, they're the only ones who would take her in. Uh, this like shining star of a of a human being, mm. uh, really gifted. Uh, uh, intelligent person, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, 
I think now that she's seen what the the left has to offer her, I don't think she uh, regrets going uh, AEI. She doesn't. I don't think she cares too. I actually think she just sees them as an, uh, a nuisance, an annoyance. I don't think she's really heard about it uh, much anymore. She's doing just fine, I think. I think at this point, most serious people will consider, at least you know, the part of the left that we have in mind. They will consider them a nuisance because there is no other other choice at this point, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a shame. It really is. Yeah, well, but yeah, to, to get back to the the book Terror and Liberalism, I, I think we can make a clear you know transition because um, to get back to Ramadan for a, for a while, mm-hmm. um, he defends and he. I mean, he really lionizes his his grandfather, uh, Hassan al Banna, the founder of the of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and um, that movement is really, at least by most people who have looked at the history, taken to be the the uh, starting point of at least contemporary. Um, Political Islamism, or political Islam, I should say. Um, and so it, it it was founded in Egypt after the um, dismantlement of the um, Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Founded by this school teacher Al Banna, and uh, very quickly they turned to. Um, the Italian fascists, the Spanish fascists, the German fascists f- for inspiration, for lack of a better word. They also had read their sort of German counter-enlightenment philosophy. Some of them had. Suddenly later, Said Qutub did, but uh, I don't think he was the only one far from it. Um, so yeah, that would be... Uh, the gen- genesis of a contemporary movement of sort of Islamic supremacism. And this is, I think, agreed upon by most people. And I read recently, uh, I think I told you, um, this this book in German, uh, but the title can be very easily understood. It's Der Islamische Fascismus from, um, what's his name? Hamid Abdel Samad. He's a guy who is himself from Egypt, a former member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was, I think, on the several times now on the the Get Sad uh, podcast. How old is this guy? This guy is maybe in his late forties by now, something like that. That's what he looks like to me, okay. at least. Yeah, but okay. he he lives in Germany, and he speaks he speaks German, writes in German. And uh, yeah, I mean, he 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 wrote this book as a history, really of. Islamic supremacism and yeah, a fair a fair amount of the book is devoted to the Muslim Brotherhood, and this is also the case in uh, Berman's Terror and Liberalism. Uh, he discusses Al Banna. He discusses Said Qutb, who you were mentioning, mm-hmm. and um, he really insists on the parallels between this movement and the European. Uh, sort of anti anti liberal uh, movements that were well taking over the continent at, at more or less the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's true. I, I think what I meant uh, about like contemporary uh, participants in these operations, like the hijackers at nine eleven. I don't think the totalitarian model is like what's mapped on their minds. I think they're thinking about heaven and uh, stuff like that. that. That's what I meant. I think it start, as far as the genesis is concerned and the, the framework for the movement in general, it is it is the same uh, 1920s uh, t- uh, birth as all the others. They just didn't get a, a ball rolling like uh, Franco and uh, the Bolsheviks and all the, you know, Mussolini and all them did. But yeah, it's um, I, apparently one of those movements also was the uh, predecessor to the Ba'ath Party in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, 
that's interesting. And they act, they acted like they they acted like a real twentieth century totalitarian group. Yeah, well, Baathism is socialism and also nationalism. So that's yeah, yeah fairly, yeah. fairly straightforward. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, and and you get it from it, the the problem with uh, disparate attacks, uh, jihadist attacks, is you get everyone else, everyone, all these individual people's testimonies. It doesn't, it's not as, uh, uh, cogent as hearing an, a government, official government, like, uh, say what they stand for and, and, you know, read, read what they've written on their flag. And I, you know, it's like, uh, it's cemented with the Baathists. I mean, they were, they were that what they were trying to be. Um, and, but you know, it, it, again, it's confusing because, like, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein had a, a Quran written in his own blood. So it, the theological and the terrestrial are, you know, but it so it so went with the with the other movements. I mean, mm-hmm. I think he had a um, well a change of tactics at least. Uh, I think after the the failure of the invasion of Kuwait, right? I think I remember Hitchens explaining this. That yeah, he became really pious after. Yeah, yeah, at least ostensibly get, so. To get his jihadist uh, followers to act up. Yeah. Yeah, he he rediscovered his faith. <clears throat> <laughs> the, the, there was a there was a uh, documentary on him. Well, a I don't know if you'd call it a documentary. It was a mini series with actors, mm. uh, really well, really slick, well produced thing on Netflix. Okay. About Saddam, about Saddam Hussein. Uh, really rough. That family was was messed up pretty bad. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this the uh, Tariq Ramadan's grandfather was he? He must be older than Saeed Qutb. Yeah. 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 So I think. Kotob really had his heydays, at least his most influential days, really directly after the war, after World War Two. Mm-hmm. Whereas for uh, Al Banna, uh, Ramadan's grandfather, it was uh, in the interwar period, so really um, the twenties, you know, in the in the wake almost of the um, collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Um, yeah, yeah, so he, um, he did found that movement. They were the, really the main, the two main figures of, of the movement, um, up until, um, I mean, I think uh, still to this day, at least I suppose on an intellectual level, I don't, I don't know if there are people who have had such an influence on, on the movement, on, on the Muslim Brotherhood per se. Of course, on Islamist movements more generally, we can think about uh, al Qardawi and other people, but uh, the Muslim Brotherhood itself, yes, I think they would be the main, the two main theorists. And, um, yeah, so they, they were both, uh, Al-Banna especially, was very... Um, I mean, very impressed with uh, European fascism um, up until, you know, I mean, he didn't he didn't turn on it uh, when the worst the worst of its crimes were were revealed to the public. Quite the contrary, he knew more or less what was happening to the to the Jews of Central Europe, and uh, I think, I mean, this. Right now, I'm going really on memory, so I should I should be careful. But uh, yeah, I'm working on doing that myself. <laughs> yeah, s- suddenly, um, I don't think he ever had a problem with uh, the uh, the third the third Reich. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I mean th- this this is the case of um, well, the the Islamist movement at that time, and certainly as you were pointing out. To a large extent, the um, nas- I mean, the Arab nationalists movements of that era, who were also, I mean, they call them they call themselves nationalists and socialists, 
as Berman, you know, uh, rightly warns his readers, um, in the case of the Arab nationalisms, one should be careful because there was also uh, a more pragmatic element in the uh, sort of alignment with uh, Germany and Italy, which is that these were the enemies of imperial imperial United King, Kingdom and imperial France who had colonies in, in the Middle East. And of course, you know, even if you are not a national socialist or, a, or an Islamist, you will be displeased with uh, having your country uh, under the under the rule of a foreign power like who came mm -hmm. in and just took control. So, I mean, there is that element of pragmatism and the sort of sympathy for the Axis forces by the uh, Arab nationalists. But in the case of the Islamists, I think there was a closer ideological, I mean, yeah, sympathy. Do you think the is the idea that the anti-Semitism was already built into the Islamists because of some of their uh, their texts, the foundational texts from their religion? or Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, in the case of anti-Semitism, it really seems to be an invariant of any authoritarian political movement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I remember uh, Hitch and uh, Martin Amos had a like a, a sit down long discussion. It's on YouTube. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, they were, but the main thing was about uh, anti Semitism. That's what the whole conversation was about. And one one of them said, uh, and uh, anti Semitism is the first sign that someone's lost their mind. Someone's losing their mind. It's like <laughs> when someone becomes a schizophrenic. Uh, mm. You know the Jews are are after them. It's it's like without fail. It's like the iconic, uh, paranoid, schizophrenic thing to to be uh, fixated on. And so there's a lot of that going on right now. Um, there is, including in France. I don't know if you're following, but uh, I mean, I will. I should not comment on that at too much length. But we have massive protests on the streets. At least as far as I can tell from here, they are pretty massive. Uh, uh, what? I mean, well, I that's the the so-called yellow vests, right? Yeah, that's ongoing, though, right? It is still ongoing, right? And um, well, I mean, they, I mean, the general idea was that they are protesting the politics of the current government. Uh, initially, it started because the government wanted to increase taxes on fuel, so you would think maybe it's an anti-taxation sort of small government protest, but it quickly it emerged that although they do want lower taxations, they also do want stronger state power, increased state intervention in the economy. Um, they are quite hostile to the European Union. And clearly there is a, I mean, a wing of that movement I Really, I'm not able to quantify the proportion, but a non non excuse me non negligible wing of the movement that has clear uh, well how to say I mean gullibility concerning these anti Semitic conspiracy theories. You can see some of the of the yeah. of the tags that you find uh, associated to these demonstrations. You know, it's always the uh, I mean, it's always some some of them, of course, but this is a recurring trope uh, concerns the uh, alliance between the government, the banks, and the Jews. Uh, yeah, this is a classic mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. So, but but for sure, I mean, this this is clearly that's a shame. I didn't know that that movement was that sin that sinister. I thought they were more of like a working class uprising. Well, yeah, to some extent, it is. I mean, one should not. You know, say that what I've described represents the whole of the movement. No, 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 no. You're very clear about that. I've, yeah, I'm yeah. saying my perception from yeah. just you know seeing scarce things on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, it is true that it's uh, it's mostly a working class movement for sure. It seems. Um, mm. I think that's uh, I think that's fair to say, but um, I see people like uh, Brendan O'Neill are very. 
uh, proud of the, what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too surprised, but uh... it's and I understand it's seductive. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I understand the seduction of uh, Brexit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand, like definitely, but it is that is an extreme change, and uh, that you know. I don't know that you're like you said, I mean, you, and you're, you're spending time in, in gr- mobs of people in the street. That's yeah. how it's like a, a, a good way to get uh, crazy talk going and spreading and being, uh, you know, amplified and taken in the wrong direction. I mean, I, I, they're out there every day, right? I mean, I've seen people. No, it's, only, it's only once a week, essentially. I mean, is it like a known thing that they happen on a certain time? Yeah, it's every Saturday. So the rest of the time, I'm sure there's punctual action. But every Saturday, there is a huge thing in Paris, at least. Um, it might be receding in, in amplitude. I, I'm not able to um, to comment on that. But um, yeah. It looks like they've been doing some real damage, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these are large-scale demonstrations, and you will always find, uh, I mean, a wing of it that is... Either which is really a sincere part of the movement and that sort of loses its temper and starts breaking things, or people who come from the outside just for the sole purpose of, you know, breaking stuff. So I wonder how this, uh, Berman talked in this terror and liberalism, Berman talked about uh, losing sight of liberal optimism, Mm -hmm. Uh, the the liberal optimism of the 19th century. Um, He was saying that after World War One, the the horrific murderousness of that war sort of sapped everyone's ability to imagine or to conceive of that liberal optimism of the previous century. Yeah, I it's you know it makes you it makes you wonder just how tenuous that whole thing is. I mean, it seems to me like self evident that these these liberal principles are. Sort of, uh, it's like um, no no real alternative uh, are as uh, elegant and as uh, effective um, for making uh, prosperous, happy people and societies. So it, it's pretty scary to know that it can be uh, people can lose their faith in it uh, on a, a global scale. Uh, mm-hmm. In the event of being uh, traumatized by an, uh, an event, I mean, I'm not, of course, I'm not saying it wasn't traumatic, but uh, to think you have to start from scratch, um, or I don't know, I mean, I don't know how, um, maybe, I don't know if they, if they drew some causal relationship between the liberal principles and World War I. I don't know how they justified scrapping it, but, mm-hmm. uh, or maybe it wasn't explicit, maybe it was just a tacit thing, but. Well, the same thing happened in the wake of World War Two. I think, I think it happened twice, um, and I'm not so knowledgeable about what happened after World War One. I. I mean, concerning the point which you raise, which is for sure, it's true, and I, I've had a, a guest, a French guest, on on the show, and uh, um, yeah, I mean. Suddenly, after World War Two, there was actually um, quite some disillusion with uh, liberal ideas coming from the intellectual left, uh, especially in France, and they became very seduced with the sort of German ideas that had flourished uh, from the 19th century onwards up until the, the mid, mid-20th mid century. You know, the, the likes of Nietzsche and Heidegger. And uh, these, these were the French post-structuralists, and they were very well received in the U.S., and it, you know, was the sort of catalyst for postmodernism in America. And I, I see it, and I, I'm far from the only one I see it, is really the, the, the root cause of the sort of postmodern domination of university campuses in uh, so but this okay I will not discuss this any further but in, in any case they had taken the uh, <laughs> they had taken the um, 
the scorn and the uh, rejection of basic liberal ideas of the German intellectuals to heart because they did think the um, sort of post-war intellectual class, I mean, certainly a non-negligible part of it, thought that uh, World War II was not so much a failure to uphold those principles, but rather they were thinking that it was sort of the uh, result of these principles. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you had... And this was also already, I mean, it has a long history and already in the interwar period, I mean, after World War I, there were these, um, these, um, well, no, I, I, I misspoke. I, I should say before World War II, but when, when the Nazis were already in power in Germany, there were these uh, Frankfurt School intellectuals, right? I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, um, they were Jewish intellectuals from Germany the likes of uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, and they wrote this book, Dialectic, der, um, so in German it's Dialectic der Aufklärung, Dialectic of Enlightenment. And they really indicted, especially science in it, because they thought science and discovery was sort of the ultimate op oppressive process, whereby you really sort of assert your domination over which you come to understand. And also they really disliked, as far as I can understand, uh, the power that understanding gives you, because then you become able to, well, craft technology and to actually act on, on, on the world. And this, is, this they called instrumental reason, and they really uh, indicted it very strongly. And this also has... Uh, you know, informed the uh, American campus intellectuals. For yeah, sure. I was going to say that sounds like uh, sounds like 2019 stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the guys from this school, he was a bit more junior, and he really became famous later. But he was Marcuse, and he was in a big guy in the 60s counterculture, and he had been. A, uh, a figure in this Frankfurt school in the 30s and he also had studied with Heidegger incidentally he had tried to synthesize Heidegger with uh, Marxism I mean there is a long history there but to connect this with post World War I this French guest of, of mine so he wrote a big book on Heidegger and his clear Nazi um well, it's, it's beyond sympathy. It's really, uh, you know, he was 100%, he was a believer in National Socialism. Uh -huh. And um, according to him, you know, the, these left-wing intellectuals post-World War II, they were more or less the mirror image of these right-wing intellectuals post-World War I, and both sort of lost faith or lost any sort of interest, really, in uh, uh, sort of the ideas of progress via liberty and uh, understanding of the world that had animated much of the intellectual class in the 19th century. And there is also this book by, um, I think the names of the authors are Buruma and Margalit, and it's called Occidentalism, and it's also discussing similar themes. It's sort of a mirror image of the book Orientalism, which I'm sure you've heard about by Edward Said. Mm -hmm. And in it, they also explore very similar themes of how sort of German culture in particular had progressively come to define itself as opposed to the, the Enlightenment and uh, liberalism and how people in Japan had read these and how this had influenced Japan's uh, sort of alliance with Germany and also how it had to connect this back to terrorism, how it had influenced the um, kamikaze pilots during World War II. Apparently a fair number of them were students of the humanities who had read German philosophy from the 19th century. Really? Yeah. Wow. So there is yeah. a long intellectual history there. I mean, you know, one should not consider that 
every single person who adheres to these types of movements is aware of all the theory from uh, Fichte and Nietzsche and all the German philosophy onwards. This is far from being true, but yeah, yeah, there is affiliation. So the have you? You said you have not read the Rebel from Camus. No, I have not read anything from him to my shame. So I I had the ambition to do it. So that, I thought it would inform this conversation, but it really is to me at least. I'm I'm not the most intelligent man on earth, but it is uh it is pretty dense and uh, obscure stuff. Like uh like I said, I don't and and it seems to be pivotal to Berman. It seems mm-hmm. to be really important to Berman. Yeah. Uh, and for understanding uh, it, it, the, the, an individual's mind uh, in, involved in this stuff, uh, not not like the you know beginning of the movement and the movement as a whole, but uh, the individual psychology of uh, um, suicide, mur- murder, suicide uh, behavior, um, and the, the the mutation from wanting to uh, make your own way in the world to uh, um, rejecting moral norms, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's where I get lost. Mm-hmm. And may, may, maybe when they, call, when they call them irrational uh, mass movements, maybe that's the part where, that I just need to accept uh, instead of trying to figure out. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? um, like maybe, maybe that's my, uh, maybe I'm making the same mistake that the you know, 1930s anti-war socialist made. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm spending too much time uh, trying to make sense of that part when I when I don't need to. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? Yeah, I think I think this uh, this book Occidentalism helps me understand this because um, and and also I mean one can simply think of of uh, Nietzsche's works, right? You you can think about Beyond Good and Evil. I mean certainly in his later works. He became very, well, uh, very strong worded in in the direction that um, really the um, the worth of a person is measured by their willingness to um, disregard moral norms, because to him these were um, essentially norms invented by weaker people in order to sort of defend their own interests and okay but but i i have to be my there's a biological essentialism screaming out right now to me (laughs) that's such maladaptive behavior and that's such a maladaptive mindset there's no way that you can just switch that on unless you're a psycho a genuine clinical psychopath you can't i can understand also you can be persuaded by a philosophy Mm -hmm. but to write it down and to try to make make an argument because yeah. he's appealing to reason to say that that makes sense. And it, of course it doesn't. I mean, if everyone had that attitude, it would be hell on earth and it would be a short uh, time. It wouldn't last very long. Yeah. That, that's, um, that's probably the case. I mean, in his earlier life, he was actually much friendlier to uh, the enlightenment. He dedicated some of his books to Voltaire. So he really changed his mind at, at the end of his, of his career. And then he really, sort of collapsed into uh, outright mental illness. But this this is um this this idea of sort of ditching sort of what people today might call sort of middle class values. Um it's it's been very seductive to um people who adhere to these sort of authoritarian anti modernity if you will movements. And uh, the the way you can you can sort of see this most clearly as far as I was able to see is that they really resent everything that has to do with trade and commerce. To them, this is the pinnacle of mediocrity. Everything which is peaceful trades, they see as sort of self-interest and sort of a mediocre activity. Whereas to to the merchant, they really oppose the, the hero who is sort of transcending the paradigm and uh, sort of acting in violent ways. But um, yeah, in, in a praise where they see that with uh, or they describe that with praise in as much, of course, as the 
the ideals of the hero align with theirs, but usually there is a, a good alignment because even though these movements are diverse, there are invariants, and this is some of the one of the things that Berman discusses. Yeah, uh, the the violence with the Islamists. I mean, the Islamists have a uh, a very old book that ha actually has prescriptions for behavior. Well. I mean, not that's not true. The, I mean, the Hadith has some uh, examples of how the the Prophet lived, and um, it's not it's not. I mean, they have a a, a, built, a sort of built in uh, society building framework uh, that's already you know sort of all encompassing, and uh, but and and the violence part, uh, you know, the, the word jihad has two meanings. I understand, but. Mm -hmm. There is one. There is one meaning that means holy war and fighting in defense of the faith, and it's not, it, it doesn't take a lot of uh, energy to, you know, to tell someone that they should behave that way to be, and it would be a good thing. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of contortion to make someone buy into that, um, especially if they're already a, a Muslim. But yeah. the other the other uh, movements like. Um, they all become they all became death cults but that that part that part is uh where i get lost i mean mm -hmm. um i mean your your death murder suicide those are protests those are uh you know what i mean i i'm trying to think of the psychology behind it um yeah uh Camus does tries to but he lost me i have to be perfectly honest okay well, I can't help with that, but <laughs> yeah, I know you won't. You won't be able to help me. <laughs> yeah, have you, I haven't heard much from Berman lately. Do you know what he's up to now? Uh, really not. Um, no, I, I don't know. I think he. I don't know why. I, actually, this is um, this is something we we can discuss. Um, I don't know why he had so few public interactions with people like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens. And this really. It's strange, it's right? Puzzling to me because they were really discussing similar themes. I think they were broadly in agreement. I think they had a very complementary uh, outlooks. I mean, really, they were emphasizing different ways of looking at looking at the at the questions, but coming, I think, to similar conclusions. And somehow it didn't really happen. Of course, Harrison Hitchens talked a lot to each other but Berman um although they cited him I think uh, yeah they, they've all especially um Martin Amos I don't know okay. how much you have listened to him speak about this stuff. just um, a little bit Amos a few times I have it's very clear that he has read Berman I mean uh -huh. it, uh the, the interviews he did around this time period yeah because he, he was embroiled in some controversies for being mm -hmm. very frank about uh, <laughs> this stuff um and when he was dragged onto some, you know, TV show to uh, apologize and explain himself, um, which this is why I love Martin Amos. He just doesn't do that. And he gets mm -hmm. angry. And it's very entertaining. Um, but when he's describing, uh, you know, when he gets into like the ideas, the big ideas and the deep thinking behind Islamism, it's very clear he's read Berman because some of it's almost verbatim mm -hmm. uh, is the language. Uh, the way Berman describes it. Mm. Uh, okay. And same with uh, um, Lawrence Wright and George uh, Packer. Okay. Uh, um, they uh, they actually I mean they speak about Berman directly. Mm -hmm. I can't I'm, I think I'm confusing those two books. Uh, Assassin's Gate uh, by Packer. It's a, it's about the war in Iraq, but it's much. De it's not just a like ride along. Uh, a military strategy book it's a, it's about it's about iraq it's about the uh regime there and it's it's a lot deeper than it sounds but mm -hmm. um it was either him or lawrence wright who personally knew Berman and like we were, was describing his behavior i think he's very uh he uh he's a, a kind of a loner like he he, he would go they, he, they said they would see him in like a cafe like eating a cheeseburger like with books on the table like by himself <laughs> Uh, in New York, like, yeah. uh, and you know, he, I think he he didn't he didn't finish graduate school. He went to Columbia mm -hmm. history, and uh, and then he he dropped out and just he, he think he's taught himself. You know, he's he's working on his own. Uh, you know, writing on his own, reading mm -hmm. on his own. 
Um, but yeah, I've seen his book. Like Sam Harris used to have a book list of books he recommends, and Paul Berman's book was on there. Sure. Um, and I've never uh, Hitchens. Uh, he he recommended books, but they were usually like classics or yeah. It was very. I don't. It's kind of rare to hear him like talking about a, a modern contemporary book, but mm-hmm. um, and I never really saw him chumming around with anyone either. But <laughs> and I I don't I, you know Berman did appear after the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre uh-huh. uh, on American television. Uh, this and, I did not know. Yeah, it's a short clip. You can find it on YouTube. Um, I think Charlie Hebdo, Paul Berman would do it if you type that. Um, but it's, you know, the typical just sort of ditzy uh, reporters asking the ditzy questions. Uh, and he's just as same as he ever was, just saying, that, you know, this is a classical totalitarian movement. Mm-hmm. And we have to do the only way to you know, defeat this is to wage a war of ideas. You know, he was, he has his boilerplate or whatever, but, um, he, he, uh, beyond that, I haven't seen or heard much of, I think he does some like, uh, you know, writing stuff. Like he'll, he'll do like speeches or award ceremonies, but, um, I think he's a loner. I think he's just kind of a quiet guy. Yeah. Yeah. Very quiet, which is a bit of a shame, but, uh, I suppose there is a correlation between serious people and quiet people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, 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 that interview we were, we were talking about earlier, the one right after the book was published, it, he's a really quirky guy on that squeaky, kind of a squeaky voice. Like, <laughs> I watch it a bunch. It's all, it, it's awesome. It's like a four part video. Yeah, parts one through four. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm not sure it's the same then because I, I what I watched was long ish, but not quite that long. Um, well, they're they're about seven minutes each. So oh, okay, like, then yes, then probably. If you clicked on the that, list, yeah. it felt like a three-minute video or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. Okay, then it's 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 probably that. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't it wasn't Charlie Rose. It was the other guy. I can't remember ah. his name. He's got gray hair and glasses. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's, okay. I, there's not much. It's book book notes. I think is the mm-hmm. program. And. Um, yeah, he, you could tell he was still like fresh, uh, just finishing writing it and was mm. very excited about it. But I think by that time it had already been like picked up and people it was I think, like I said, it was feeding a uh, sort of like ignorant, uh, our, our, especially like our intelligent agencies. We had we had no idea what these people were thinking, what was <laughs> on their mind. Um, and, and, you know, when you they do they when they after, you know, like coal bombings uh, or whatever, they'll. Uh, Bin Laden will mention terrestrial grievances, but and I could see how you could be misled into thinking that was the uh, beginning and end of it. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I think Berman's book was really influential um, in terms of uh, deepening and broadening uh, the understanding. Um, and I guess he was just in a d- diner somewhere by himself, learning to figure this out. <laughs> I guess this is stuff he was already thinking about and it tied into it somehow. Yeah. I definitely felt more, uh, after reading this, it felt more like I had an upgrade, like a, a firmware upgrade. Mm. Um, because I, I think people who have the correct instinct to understand that this is, that they mean what they say and this is religious in, uh, in a large degree and, or it's, it's uh, you know, pathological. <laughs> uh, if they don't have um, a reasonable voice to explain how this kind of thing can happen to otherwise reasonable people. Um, I could see someone getting, you know, you know, that's where like bigotry could come in and, uh, you know, the clash of civilizations type of mindset, Mm -hmm. um, irreconcilable differences. Um, and, uh, Tariq Ramadan, <laughs> have you seen that? Have you seen his interview or his uh, debate with uh, um, Douglas Murray? Oh, huh. I'm not sure. I th- it's a, the, vi- the video is called like uh, Douglas Murray uh, defends Western values. Ah, but like. th- there are other people, right, involved? Yeah, yeah. There I was, can't remember the other guy's name. There was no, uh, 
Oh yeah, on on Ramadan's side, I don't know. I think there was some guy named Glass. Glass, yeah, he sounded Austrian or something. Perhaps. And on on yeah. uh, Mars side, there was uh, David Aronovich, who's a British mm-hmm. journalist, and uh, Ibn Warak, the uh, famous apostate of Islam. Yeah. But so, yes, I've seen I've seen that debate here, yeah, yeah, several times, I think. Yeah. I mean my only contact with Ramadan and, and that's why I was so shocked to hear Berman uh so kind of tepid about him and uh terror and liberalism. He treated mm-hmm. him I mean I, I just based on the things I've seen of him and and I've watched long debates between him and Hitchens and Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then this one, this this panel discussion we're talking about. He just engages in sophistry and he's he's a con man with with his words. It's, it's obvious to me. I mean, straight away, um, he makes moral, uh, comparisons that are pretty galling, um, should be immediately noticeably uh, like wrong to people. Um, I don't know. I don't know why people are taken in by <laughs> care like that, but it seems to happen a lot. He yeah. reminds me, he, he's like a, he's a, uh, more learned version of like Reza Aslan or, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Or maybe even Deepak Chopra, the, the, the way he <laughs> talks about like you know the mind and uh, existence and stuff, he, he just sophistry, just taking a huge uh, um, uh, liberties with <laughs> the, you know how 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 two unrelated things are related and or how they're morally comparable and stuff like that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. He just struck me as a weasel like straight away. Yeah, I think you're correct. And I think uh, in as much as Berman would have been too soft on him in, in, in this book, I think he certainly um, he made, cla- up for it, like, yeah, made up for it later. But yes. So is there any, I feel like, is there any theme in this we haven't covered? Uh, I mean, I think, I think we've, um, well, we, we, we've covered the the bases I think yeah I I I made some notes but it looks like chicken scratch now so mm-hmm. yeah yeah I think uh, that's we I don't have anything different here um yeah you're saying um the uh the demographics of the people who have uh, been involved with the U- European Western European terror attacks recently mm-hmm. are more like the ghetto lower class uh uh, characterization that leftists <laughs> or whatever assumed all along. Yes, I, that is that is what this researcher told me. I th- I think that kind of go along goes along with the the uh, what ISIS is. I mean, ISIS is more. Uh, um, I'm I, I'm drawing a blank now. The the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq who got I think he was blown up in an airstrike. Um, <laughs> Damn, I can't remember his name right now, but... Uh, was it Musawi? Yes, 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 yes. He was a thug, uh, a, a low IQ thug, degenerate arms dealer. Uh, <laughs> and he, But his... his uh, uh, that model is sort of like what ISIS... Be. I mean, uh, Al-Qaeda was never like uh, lining people up and executing them with a gu- gu- handgun point blank in the head or or killing little boys uh you know they weren't doing stuff like that they they weren't they were they were flying planes in the buildings which is is bad enough but just there is a, a qualitative difference between the way isis behaves and the way al-qaeda behaves um, they did that in iraq though i mean they really yeah, yeah, yeah. they had the systematic terror campaign against civilians i mean right right I, I just I think they were it was more scruffy. The ISIS guys are more uh, raw, more uh, uh, from the streets than <laughs> Al Qaeda were. Al Qaeda were more like hand selected. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a you know higher IQ in general with, with that organization. Mm-hmm. And, but I think uh, the Iraq War kind of ended all that. Like it was a no holds bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're making a. An interesting point. I had not really thought about it like this, but um, yeah, it's it's true that I mean, yeah, 
I think it, it matches nicely the sort of empirical observation of the the changes in the uh, makeup of of these groups. Yeah. yeah. I think it's worked its way back to Al-Qaeda, though, because I know the Kowachi brothers were, uh, they were acting on behalf of Al-Qaeda. Yeah. Or what, yeah. Trained, trained by them. Yeah, yeah, and they are true. definitely more of an ISIS type, just, <laughs> by, by my definition. Yeah, yeah, in, in this, in this um, sort of classification. Yeah, they were certainly not uh, engineering graduates. No, they were um, a couple of clowns. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe we can end on a, on a hopeful note with uh because i i think we can um we can connect several things we've discussed to um the recent book by uh, Steven Pinker Enlightenment Now which i read in the summer and um so well, you can make you can make all those connections because i have not yeah, read that book yeah so first of all he documents you know many improvements in the state of the world overall. And that includes, believe it or not, terrorism, uh, which we tend to forget that it was usually even worse in the past. So that is one thing. And the, the second thing is I'm, I'm seeing more and more hints that a, well, a turn away from religion is happening even in, in the so-called Muslim world, which... Um, I mean, we, we've seen we've seen hints, and I think I, it was today that I saw a report that in Turkey it's it, this is this is happening, and I've seen reports before. And of course, we all know the sort of anecdotal evidence about all the um, all the uh, high-profile people who left Islam. And um, there is also this nice project which is called um, Ideas Beyond Borders. You might have heard oh. of it. Led yeah. by uh, Faisal Saeed Al Mutar, and I think also Melissa Chen is involved in that. Yeah, that's right. And also Steven Pinker actually is on is on the board, and they are translating books into Arabic and maybe also other languages. I, I'm not sure about other languages, but I, I, yeah, I think I think I saw, so. There's some fundraising going on for that. Yeah, I think that's great. And those books would be available for free, and I think. Uh, it would contribute to the dynamics, but this dynamics is already existing, and we can also think about the example of Iran, uh, especially where it is, I think, known by any person who has really, you know, been informed a little bit about what's happening in the country. That the, uh, I mean, a large part of the population is only really doing the bare minimum to. Um, Placate the uh, Islamist regime, but they are n certainly not favorable to to uh, to the regime. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely noticed that. Um, did, did you ever use Periscope? That app? No, no. The same way it went for. I mean, uh, Iraq. You, you would you would talk to Iraqis and smoking hookah and stuff in these zones. You thought were like this black flag draped hellhole. Yeah. Um, there, you know. It's not. It's it's a lot. People want to enjoy their life and in the in the most efficient way possible. And it, I, I I'm always optimistic, always. Mm -hmm. But it does take effort to push back against this uh, pa uh, mass movement, pathological mass movements. I mean, it, it it does. They do expire in time, uh, but it's not. Uh, you know, it, it takes active. Uh, pressure, uh, arguments, um, which I think is one of Berman's main points in the mm -hmm. book, you know, it has to be, uh, the alternatives have to look better, like soft power, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. just, you know, lead by example, like look, look, enjoy your life and, uh, be happy and let other people see that. And they'll eventually get bored of the superstitions and, uh, carnage. <laughs> I would hope. I think that would get old after a while. Yes, well, the problem is it has to get old for every new generation, maybe, so... Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, mean, that's... maybe not, but, you know, there is some sort of, well, reboot time, so to say. Yeah, and then, I mean, yeah. One should one should be aware of this, this sort of cyclical views of history. It's certainly not uh, very rigorous in any, in any sense, but uh, I think, um, you know... It's it's easy to forget that as imperfect things may be in the 
in the freer societies, uh, it's still it's still pretty great. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's luxurious, actually. No matter you know how mediocre you think your life is, you're in the lap of luxury. Mm-hmm. Did, did um, it was Enlightenment now written recently enough to cover um, like the past three or four years in the West? Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's very recent. It was published. Oh, I think it's almost been a year now or something like that, but a little bit less perhaps. So yes, it was written, I would say written during and after the uh, American presidential campaign of 2016. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is like this post-World War One period we were talking about earlier where it was up for grabs. You know, like uh, any any anything could was on the table. Yeah. Um, and the tried and true stuff was somehow like not clearly untrustworthy for some reason. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I get the sense that like we we're getting closer to a, a, a phase like that, especially with the the popularity of postmodernism. Uh, what we're talking about in, in academia, it feels tenuous more so now than ever in my life, at least where I feel like people are sort of reinventing the wheel, like, like the intersectionality thing. I don't know. We don't have to get into this, but <laughs> it, it, it seems like going the long way around back to individualism and like core old liberal principles, you know, it, it seems like a foolish waste of time. Um, but it's extremely popular, like very popular, or at least it seems to be. I mean, uh, Hollywood, I mean, if, I would consider that a, a, a sign of popularity. Yeah. Commercials, you know, commercials uh, saying bizarre things uh, about bizarre philosophies, seriously obscure, uh, weird philosophies that don't make much sense. It has seeped out into the wider culture. I mean, it's been so powerful in academia for decades now. And this is what yeah. was, um, I discussed this, I mean, chiefly Helen Pluck. Lacrosse discussed this. I interviewed her on, on the podcast. It's been uh, close to a year now, and she, she, she suddenly talked about that. And uh, yeah, you're quite right. And this is something that Pinker discusses. And I think, um, in as much as the intellectual class is concerned, this is certainly, uh, I mean, I would agree with you. And I think, in a in sort of a mirror way, what I was describing earlier, this part of the more working class uh, electorate that is, it seems, very seduced these days by these sort of uh, very simplistic views of the world with a conspiracy outlook of uh, the world being controlled by whoever that would be, the Jews, the bankers, the Freemasons, and the sort of disconnected elites I think it's also, um, it also can be classified broadly in the same category of people ditching what was broadly working and choosing something that they think is sort of a perfect, obvious solution, but really it's, it's not. Right, right. But, but and, and the, the thing that's strange is like the lesson that lesson like exactly that lesson has been learned very recently mm-hmm. in you know the early twenty twentieth century yeah. uh, in in I mean in the most you know uh, as a rhetorical device like tens of millions of people being killed uh, is should be more powerful than it is I guess um, but, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not catastrophizing. I'm not saying we're anywhere close to that. I'm just, I'm saying I get a little itching and scratching of like this, like we're starting, we're born yesterday and we're starting from scratch with thinking about how life when the world works or how to maximize human flourishing and like, like it's all up for grabs, like that sort of feeling. Um, whereas it just doesn't seem very wise. We have to think that are proven, you know, like um, unimaginable prosperity. Uh, I'd probably stick with that, but. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, Pinker really 
blames the well I mean the human tendency to focus on the negative and also to um well I mean I yeah I suppose that covers it pretty much to to focus on the negative so the media is of course has an incentive to focus on negative events and even if they were presented I think with positive and negative stories people would naturally focus on the negative ones so there is sort of a double layer of um domination if you will sort of whereby negativity will naturally dominate people's minds and uh, it seems that yeah. it has gotten a bit worse recently i would certainly agree with you on that and this is i think what decided him to write this book yeah yeah i mean i need to get on top of that mm. so maybe it's a good time to wrap it up now if uh if you agree sure, sure. yeah We've had a great discussion. I think we covered everything and more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Concerning the book. And um, yeah. Enjoy. So thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Liberté Académique. We are a science, critical thinking and freedom podcast. We interview researchers, teachers and authors who have interesting ideas and who defend free rational, evidence-based thought. We oppose as best we can a sort of anti-intellectualism coming from a section of the intellectual class. We carry out interviews in English and in French. You can find all our episodes on YouTube and on SoundCloud, as well as on the main podcasting platforms such as iTunes, Stitcher and several others. We are also present on Twitter at AcadFreedom and also on Facebook.